Hello and welcome to this Royal Society video podcast. I'm Claire Birch and I'm here with Dr John Agar, Historian of Science at University College London. Recently he's written an article for our dedicated History of Science journal Notes and Records entitled Thatcher Scientist, which explores how the infamous politician was shaped by her early lesser known scientific career. So John, why are you interested in Margaret Thatcher in the first place? Well Margaret Thatcher is one of our, the dominant personalities of our age the most important politicians. I mean, I remember Margaret Thatcher right from the 1970s when I was a child. I remember the chance of uh, Margaret Thatcher milk snatcher. But it's the 1980s when she was one of the most uh, dominant political personalities on the global stage. She obviously reshaped British politics really quite radically as Prime Minister. But my interest is as a historian of science, um, Margaret Thatcher was a trained scientist. She worked in industrial science. Uh, and my question really is, is what extent her work as a scientist affected her work as a politician. What exactly did Margaret Thatcher study and did she have a long career in science? She did, she, I mean, about a decade. Uh, she, she, um, she went to Oxford in 1943, in the middle of the Second World War. Uh, she studied chemistry there. She studied there for four years and did a dissertation uh, working with Dorothy Hodgkin, uh, one of the most important um, scientist of the 20th century. Uh, she's an X-ray crystallographer. Um, and after four years at Oxford, she uh, got a job with a company called British Xylonite, or BX, uh, a, a plastics company, essentially, that was based in Essex. She worked there for several years, and then uh, worked at Lyons, J. Lyons & Co., uh, who many people remember from their tea shops. And we'd had a major research laboratory um, in, uh, in London. And she worked in the food research laboratory there, uh, working on all kinds of aspects of food chemistry, essentially. Uh, and that gave her further years of you know, practical working experience as, a, as an industrial scientist. And throughout all those years, yes, she was a, uh, a staunch conservative, very active in student conservative circles. Um, but Alongside that was her working life experience as a chemist. There are many opinions about Thatcher the politician. Um, why do you think that Thatcher the scientist has been ignored? Yes, I mean, Thatcher as a politician has been so dominant uh, that the biographers of Margaret Thatcher skip over her life as a, as a scientist, as a chemist, because the, their main interest is explaining her political formation, where did her ideas come from, um, her career as a politician. And for them, the her role as a scientist, her life as a scientist, seems uh, a strange you know, sideline in her life. Whereas I think actually the lived experience of, of being a working scientist um, proved very important. Very important, uh, not least because in the 1970s during Edward Heath's administration, she was the minister responsible for science. Margaret Thatcher was an uh, honorary fellow of the Royal Society. Did she work closely with them? I would describe their relationship as close, although it's one of those things that when the archives are open, that's when we'll find out more, especially about the 1980s. Um, in the 1970s, she obviously wasn't a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, she didn't have the standing as a scientist that many of the obviously the fellows had, but crucially she had to deal with them. And there's a, there's a very important episode in the uh, early 1970s when I think the, some of the key decisions in British science policy were up for, up for grabs. And the Royal Society were advising her strongly one way and uh, she came to a totally different view, one that involved much more, involved an acceptance of of a strong role of markets in science, for example. And it's that clash, I think, that is, is most interesting. How did Margaret Thatcher shape the marketisation of science? Marketisation means the, the increased roles of markets in making and guiding decisions. Um, should science be something that's decided by groups of experts alone, or should it be uh, directed by what the public might want, or more narrowly, should it be directed to what the needs of industry, the needs of the market should be. And in the 70s and 80s there was a big debate in Britain about the extent to which markets should play a role 
in shaping um, science policy. What did Margaret Thatcher do for science during her career and was it wholly positive? Yes, I mean, she, if you looked at her record as a scientist you wouldn't find it particularly impressive. Um, she, did, she was a published scientist, she published a co-authored a paper on saponification, which is the process of making soap, I suppose, but it's a general chemical process. Um, she, her work in British Xylenite, the um, plastics firm, was mostly to do with polyvinyl chloride. It's mostly about glue. There's a story that's been running since the 80s, uh, really since, since um, Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister, that she was involved with the, the science behind Mr Whippy style ice creams, ice creams that had lots of air in, um, that Lyons was indeed working on, but there's no evidence I have found uh, that she was directly involved with the invention of, of, of cheap, poor quality ice cream. What's most interesting is her experience of being a scientist. She saw science from the inside and what I'm interested in is how are decisions made about science? Um, how do politicians make crucial decisions about the direction of science or should they? Do you think her early career in science shaped her political decisions? I do and, and the crucial episode I think is in the early 1970s. This is when under Heath she is the Minister for Education and Science and there's a, there's a meeting and the meeting starts, it's called because it just needs to solve a, a niggling issue about the place of agricultural research. But it becomes actually a debate that is, has much, much, much broader significance. And it becomes a, a decision about what role should markets play in science. On the table is an argument from Lord Rothschild, Victor Rothschild, uh, who is also a trained scientist, he was a, a, a biophysicist. Um, and he had come in, been invited to come into government to, do, to run their think tank. And his proposals were that, were that research and development um, should be uh, allocated according to a customer contractor principle, i.e. that you should think about decisions in allocating funds in science, in certain areas of science, according to a market type model and that was on the table and actually it was against it was a whole range of vested interests, interests that said that science is a special case, that it should be kept autonomous and it was into that argument that Margaret Thatcher stepped and you can see in this crucial meeting that she goes in fully briefed to argue that science is a special case, that it shouldn't be um, uh, subject to these kinds of uh, market type arguments and during that meeting she changes her mind. And was her mind changed because the Prime Minister and her, his senior advisers lent on her? Well I think that's rather passive for our view of Margaret Thatcher, she's not that kind of person. I think that during this meeting she was confronted with a concrete example where there was a choice and it was a concrete example which ran totally against precedent it's never been done this way before in these areas um, and it went against the, the advice for example coming from the Royal Society um, and it's always been a bit of a mystery why Margaret Thatcher became a, a Thatcherite. She wasn't a Thatcherite in the early 70s uh, or, or in the 60s um, and very few people were. It was these kinds of ideas were right on the fringe of economics and my argument is that you can look at concrete examples where someone like Margaret Thatcher confronts moments where you could go either market or not market and she chose and science is a, is a real special case because she thought that science was some of the best aspects of um, public um, funding for example yet here was a case where she was being advised not to do to go down the market route yet she did and one thing I think in, the, in her life that's important here is that she, unlike any other minister for science, had working experience of what science was like, had been through laboratories, especially industrial chemistry laboratories, which are obviously um, responsive to markets. They need to design, innovate um, to come up with better glues or to better, um, better um, ice creams.
Um, so I think it's a, it's a fascinating case where only Margaret Thatcher at that moment could make that one of those radical steps. And once she'd done that, she could then think through the implications in other areas. So it's an early example of how, where Margaret Thatcher thought like a Thatcherite. And do you think this influence is still being felt today? Yes, absolutely. We live in a world which has been shaped by the decisions taken by under Margaret Thatcher's radical 1980s government. And that also applies to science. We're encouraged to think of science as a contribution to UK PLC, as a, a contribution to the wealth creation um, and um, in, in Britain. So in, in that sense, these changes in the 70s and 80s and 90s, of which Margaret Thatcher had a crucial role, um, both in setting the overall um, policy frame, if you like, but also, concretely, when she was the minister responsible for science, she started pointing in this direction. Uh, so even though she's not fondly remembered, I think it's fair to say, amongst scientists, so they remember the cuts of the 1980s, which were severe, that affected universities, that led to things like the Save British Science movement. Um, that's still in people's memories, but there's no doubt that we live in a world which was... Uh, crucially shaped by Margaret Thatcher as a, um, not only as a politician but also as a working scientist. Well thank you so much for joining us and thank you for watching this Royal Society video podcast.